Okay, everyone, welcome. Um, this is a session that I've actually been doing for uh, for quite a few years, but um, I've made some modifications to it and I've adapted it actually specifically to triathlon. If there are people that are not doing triathlon and they're only doing running or cycling, I think that there's quite a lot here that will appeal, but um, there is going to be one or two slides that are specific to uh, fueling for triathlon, whether it's short or long distance. And um, let's, uh, yeah, I hope the session's valuable. If there are any questions, I'll, I'll just pause between some of the different sections to allow for questions. And then obviously at the end, you know, we can do, um, I definitely do like an FAQ as well. Um, just let me know that you can hear me clearly. And also just a question, can you all see the screen, how to approach your race fueling? I just want to know if somebody can just let me know that you can see the screen there that I'm sharing. Okay, brilliant. I hope I can hear you and see the screen. Thanks. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, guys. All right. So, welcome. And uh, yeah, I'm just going to get started. I don't want to keep you too long because um, I can talk for days. Okay. So, the session I'm going to do tonight is really how to teach you how to approach your race feeling. And from a sports nutrition perspective, obviously, we're going to look at energy and hydration. But before I get like down to the nitty gritty and the business of actually fueling, I, I need to just sort of explain how the human body works when it comes to tapping into its uh, natural energy resources and how that actually works, because that will give you a much better idea of how you can actually structure your fueling, not just for racing, but also for, uh, for your uh, training session, because it's very important to be able to structure your sports nutrition around your training um, and understand exactly what the requirements are so that you can actually bed that down and then take it to race day. So even though sort of I know 70.3 Muscle Bay is quite a few weeks ahead, but then, you know, looking towards PE or for those of you that are doing Ironman or any other long course triathlons, um, regardless of uh, the time to a specific event, it will give you a really good idea of how you can plan going forward and actually master, land up mastering the art of, of uh, fueling uh your races properly because in all honesty it makes a massive difference if you can nail it in your ability to be able to perform uh, on race day uh, it really if once you've bedded it down if you don't have to worry about it because you've practiced it over and over it's going to set you up for a much better day out okay so the first thing i want to talk about is understanding the human fuel tanks uh, and the human body has two primary fuel tanks uh, the one being glycogen uh, which is basically, it consists of around 2,000 calories, give or take here and there, I'm talking approximately, uh, and glycogen is predominantly found in our muscles and in our liver. And the glycogen fuel tank is the tank that I call rocket fuel. It's accessed when we are performing at a very high level of intensity, and I'll explain how that works a little bit later. And then we have a fat tank, which is primarily stored uh, in the form of uh, free fatty acids, uh, you can talk about subcutaneous fat, which is fat that sits under the surface of the skin, intramuscular triglycerides, which are fatty deposits in between muscle fiber, and and basically that is pretty much an unlimited fuel tank. It sits at around 40,000 calories, and to give an idea how much that can fill, you could probably run 50 consecutive marathons on that tank alone, okay, assuming that you could tap into that fuel tank alone, but each of these fuel tanks is tapped into under uh, various conditions. Those conditions have to be met in order to be able to utilize those fuel tanks. And, and, and that's what I'm going to get into now. So if we talk about the fuel tanks, being fat and glycogen as your primary fuel tanks, um, if we look at zones, and I mean, yes, there's a lot of people that understand that uh, there's zones one to five, A, B, and C, there's zones one to seven, I'm just talking about the standard sort of five zones, uh, talking about a percentage of maximum heart rate starting in zone one, which is about 50 to 60% of maximum heart rate, and then moving up to zone five, which is your highest sort of level of intensity. And that is where we're talking about 90 to 100% of maximum heart rate. In each of these zones, the human body will tap into a percentage of fuel tank usage. And that is dependent on a very specific condition, and that is the availability of oxygen in actual fact. So the more prevalent oxygen is when you are doing exercise, the more easy 
the the, the more easily it is uh, in in order to be able to burn off fat and uh, and the fat to sort of if you talk about about the fat to energy conversion ultimately landing up in the production of adenosine triphosphate which is ATP which is utilized to fire the muscles um, that entire process is sort of a long slow process and we can go into Krebs cycles and how that all works it gets very technical but oxygen is required in order to be able to burn off fat and that is what we call aerobic aerobic meaning prevalency of oxygen when you move more towards zone three, four, and five, in other words, upper zones, where your heart rate is going from 70 up to 100% of your maximum heart rate, then we oxygen becomes less prevalent. Uh, you're puffing and planting. You're not getting as, uh, a, a sufficient amount of oxygen in order to be able to convert fat into fuel. And so what happens is your body will actually access the quickest fuel source, which will be glycogen, your natural carbohydrate stores. And ultimately, that is what will be utilized to produce ATP and then fire the muscle. So if we look at zone one and two, if you look at the little fuel tanks that I've actually drawn inside those blocks there, you'll notice that in zone one, you're talking about primarily that is a fat burning zone. There's hardly any carbohydrate uh, stores tapped into. Glycogen is negligible, basically, from a fuel tank perspective. And fat is your primary fuel source. When it goes to zone two, fat is still your primary fuel source, very little bit of glycogen maybe that you would tap into, but you're talking about a very high percentage of fat that would be utilized. Once you move into zone three, you can actually see there's quite a split between glycogen and fat. Zone three is actually what we call the glycolytic zone. In other words, in zone three, you actually burn off quite a large percentage of glycogen and you're burning off a percentage of fat. Could be 55 to 45, could be 60 to 40. It really depends on an individual and their efficiency and ability to burn fat off at high levels of intensity. But zone three does become more of a glycolytic zone. And so you are going to start to deplete your carbohydrate stores at a much higher rate. And once you move into zone four, uh, fat burn becomes pretty negligible. Carbohydrate to glycogen stores becomes the primary fuel source. And zone five, it becomes the maximum fuel source. So why is it important to show you this? It's, it's important to show you this because when you are going to do any form of exercise, doesn't matter whether it's a bike, whether it's a, a run, you're going to swim, you're going to do a brick session, whatever it is, you need to understand what that level of intensity is that you're going to be performing at and the duration of that level of intensity. Obviously, with exercise, you cross zones. I mean, you might start in zone one, and build up, build up, build up, and finish strong. You might move all the way up to zone four, but what is your primary zone going to be in during that session? And once you've determined that primary fuel zone, you would know exactly how to tackle your sports nutrition from a fueling perspective. So zone one and zone two, because they're primary fat burn zones, you don't really necessarily need to fuel those up. You could do them pretty much faster. But if you are going to do an aerobic session, and it's going to be a very long session, it's possible that over time, you're going to uh, trigger what's called cardiac grip. Your heart rate will naturally just elevate over a period of time due to the duration because your core body temperature is going to heat up and eventually your heart's going to have to work harder uh, from a circulatory perspective to allow blood to circulate around the body and help cool down your engine. And that happens, obviously, as we uh, excrete fluid in the form of sweat. Um, to, to cool ourselves down. And when you do, when people tell me I'm doing only an aerobic effort and they're going to go for about two and a half to three hours, if they move out of that zone two into that zone three, they are going to go glycolytic and then fueling does need to be taken into consideration. If you can manage to stay right within a particular aerobic zone, then absolutely you'll be able to do it on more minimalistic fueling. Okay. So, when it comes to glycogen versus fat from a fuel perspective, high intensity sessions obviously deplete glycogen at a much more rapid rate. So the more effort you put in, the more carbohydrates you're going to be burning up. And in order to slow this down, to spare as much glycogen as possible, the only way you can do that is actually by ingesting carbohydrates. It's the only way so that you can use those, uh, you can use that blood glucose, uh, which is 
actually derived from breaking down carbohydrates. And if that's utilized in place of glycogen, it will spare the glycogen and allow it to last over a much longer period of time. Lower to medium, lower to medium intensity sessions will burn a higher rate of fat to glycogen. And that means that fat is the predominant fuel source, and that should be taken advantage of. Okay. Um, just from a human fuel tank usage, I drew this uh, um, infographic just to sort of simplify and explain how it works. So if you have a look on the one side, you've got your aerobic zone. On the other side, you've got your anaerobic zone. And you can see how the fat tank shifts and shapes as you move through the zones. Uh, from a usage perspective. So as you move towards more anaerobic, glycogen tank is primarily, primarily used. Uh, in the aerobic uh, segment, you'll actually notice that the fat tank is primarily used. But obviously, you're going to move between zones. You're going to use a combination of these two uh, fuel tanks. Uh, so if you have a look at the arrow I've put at the bottom there, zone one, zone two, you're looking more towards maybe no to low carb fueling. And as you move into the upper zones, you're looking at a much higher carb uh, intake in order to be able to support those levels of effort. Okay. All right. So if you now take a look at the fuel tanks and we're talking about a few fueling, like what am I going to fuel with from a carbohydrate perspective? Am I going to take carbohydrates? Am I just going to hydrate? Am I going to just go on water? If we look at zone one, it's a pure fat burn zone. If you're going to go for less than two hours in zone one, if you can hold that zone one, um, which is basically um, sitting around 50 to 60% of your maximum heart rate, and it's less than two hours, you could just go on water. Um, if you're going to go greater than two hours, chances are you probably won't stay in zone one. You probably drift over into zone two, and I would say that then you would probably want to introduce some carbohydrates. And another reason for introducing carbohydrates or feed at that point is that if you're going to go for longer than two hours, you've lost a portion of your day in which you could have consumed or ingested calories, which ultimately should aid also um, the human body from a recovery perspective. So sometimes we don't actually fuel for the actual session, but sometimes we actually fuel in order to be able to recover later. Triathletes usually train two disciplines a day, most in actual fact. I mean, you've got to put three disciplines in and if you're doing a, uh, a half or a full Ironman, long course triathlon, it's quite a number of hours. And fitting in those disciplines does require recovering from one to the next. So if you're doing a morning and an afternoon session or you're doing a double session in the morning, you absolutely need to recover from one to the next. Otherwise, you're just going to keep breaking yourself down. And a lot of times I do notice over the years, I've seen a lot of uh, multi-sport athletes. Uh, have been in such severe calorie deficits that ultimately does lead to injury and illness uh, because the body is not getting the nutrients that are required in order to be able to help it recover properly. So this is very important. So fueling the human body is not just uh, for performance. Uh, it's sometimes for recovery, and you need to take that into account. And that's why I've utilized a sort of time period. It's obviously not cast in stone, but if you're going to go for a longer period of time and you are going to lack nutrients uh, because of that, rather you ingest something that it will enable your body to have some form of support that it al allows you to recover better at a later stage. Um, if you're going in zone two, again, less than two hours, you could have fuel on water or just a mineral solution. It doesn't have to have a, it can be non-caloric. When it comes to uh, greater than two hours and definitely also low carb, uh, once you move into zone three, you'll notice less than two hours, I've actually gone there I'd say maybe up to up to 60 minutes, you could probably go with with a hydration solution. Um, but if you've got a double session, maybe you want to also go with a low-carb solution. But once you're going in zone three, you're going for greater than two hours, and definitely ingestion of carbohydrates is a, I would say, it's compulsory. And then zone four, uh, less than two hours, low-carb. Greater than two hours, definitely high-carb. And then zone five, only high-carb. And you can't go in zone five you're not going to go there for over two hours. It's very small duration efforts. Generally, you would hit zone five during interval sessions, maybe hill repeats, uh, or maybe some kind of threshold effort. But um, it's more limited from a from a from a uh, ability to perform over a lengthy period of time. And the reason you would ingest carbohydrates mainly in those zones, those upper zones, is to aid the level of performance because you want to fuel the effort and you also want to be able to recover from those uh, sessions. 
uh, a lot quicker because you are going to burn quite a bit of metal. Okay, just a couple of things that I want to touch on here. There's a lot of people that sort of do a lot of faster training sessions. They'll get up in the morning and they'll do a session. They don't really think about the type of session that they're going to do. And so they don't really take the fueling and they don't really plug the pieces together. But I'll just give you some examples. If you've got a, let's say you're riding in on the indoor trainer, for example, or what bike or whatever you want to utilize for, for, for bike training. And you've been given a, let's say you've been given a functional threshold test or you've been given VO2 intervals. If you want to hit those power numbers and you're doing that session faster, I can guarantee you that you will never achieve what you want to from a true potential perspective. If you fuel that session properly, I can guarantee you that you will hit those numbers and you'll probably even outperform those numbers. Because it's a fact that if you ingest carbohydrates and you fill that session properly, you will be able to perform a lot better because the engine, your energy system, is going to be given the support that's required in order to be able to achieve that. And that's something that I've noticed. I mean, it's over the last two decades, I've seen that with track athletes. I've seen that with anybody doing an interval session. Tell them to run, just as an example, tell them to run thousands at four minutes a K. Okay? They don't take carbohydrates, they do it faster. You'll notice that the the time over, over a period of time, they're batting to actually hold. If they've got six or seven intervals, maybe in the last interval, they're not able to nail that particular effort. Give them fuel, and I guarantee you they'll go under four minutes and they'll actually get stronger as the session gets longer. So it does have the ability to impact your ability, posit uh, impact you positively from a, an ability to outperform numbers. What does it mean if I improve those numbers? If I can push harder for longer, what do I do? I do more damage. I can create a little bit more hypertrophy, uh, which is muscle damage. What does that mean? It means that when that muscle does recover, I'm going to adapt at a much better rate. So if there's an athlete that's not fueling his sessions and he's sort of progressing very, very gradually, and there's an athlete that's really giving his force nutrition focus, you'll notice that his training adaptations will progress at a much higher rate. He'll become a much stronger maybe faster athlete over a the same duration or period of time as the athlete that's not actually fueling. And and we see that. I mean, that's pretty clear. Okay, so that's the first thing. So fuel the effort. I think it's quite important. Another thing that I want to mention is that if you look at any world-class athlete, take a Tour de France cyclist, take some world-class triathletes if you want, you'll notice that they actually are brilliant and very efficient at utilizing carbohydrates for fueling hard sessions, but they're also absolutely brilliant at utilizing their own natural fat stores for fueling sessions. They're very efficient at, at uh, fat burn, and they're also very efficient at uh, burning carbohydrates. And if you want to be a athlete of that level, you have to be able to speak both languages languages pretty fluently burning of fat and burning of carbohydrate and very often i i speak to athletes and they tell me i um i i basically train low and i race high in other words i train on very low carbs and when i go to race day i, intru I introduce much higher carbs well you can't do that and the reason being is is that the human body adapts it adapts to fueling over a period of time it's like somebody that is on a low carb high fat diet or a ketogenic diet or they don't ingest a large amount of carbohydrates they try and limit their blood glucose as much as possible the body lands up speaking what i call the fat language in actual fact it's, it's very efficient at maybe burning off fat as a fuel source and if you take that same athlete then introduce carbohydrates into the system that athlete will probably suffer from gastrointestinal distress because the body is not used to ingesting carbohydrates. Take an athlete that's uh, got a very high carbohydrate diet or uh, a mixed diet and then go and cut it and make them go and train faster, chances are they'll suffer because they, it's, in the same way, their body's not very efficient at speaking the fat language. And the human body's got the ability to adapt. We've got mitochondria, which basically produce ATP, which fire our muscles, and our energy cells rely on certain fuel sources, and those fuel sources are based on 
our sort of lifestyles, what we're doing from a day-to-day -day basis, how we're feeling, how we're eating, etc. So it's not like you can become efficient at fat burn overnight, and it's not that you can become efficient at carbohydrate uh, burning overnight. It's like learning another language. You know, I use this as an analogy. A teacher goes into a classroom and says to the students, English-speaking students, I'm going to teach you how to speak German. And so what they do is they first learn pronouns, and then maybe they learn a little bit of uh, verbs and very simple sentence structures and weeks and weeks and months go by and the sentence structures become a little bit more complicated and throwing in adjectives and you know other kinds of things and then eventually after many many months they start to become a little bit more fluent in speaking the language of, of German and then one day the teacher walks into the classroom and she starts speaking to the, the students in Spanish and now they don't understand the thing now they've got to start learning from the beginning they've got to start learning their pronouns and full sentence structures and Weeks and weeks and months go by, and then eventually you can speak Spanish. Now they can speak Spanish and German. It's exactly the same with fats and carbohydrates. You need to adapt your digestive system to the kind of fueling that you're going to be utilizing uh, during training and during racing if you really want it to work as efficiently as possible. If you need to be fluent in speaking the language of fat and the language of carbohydrate burn. Okay, and I'll explain to you um, how you can do that. Fuel for effort. So carbohydrates will give you better performance and recovery. Um, I know a lot of athletes wake up in the morning or in a bit of hard session and they're like, no, I'm going to do this. I just, I, can't, I couldn't be bothered to fuel or uh, it's just too early. I can't take a pre-training meal or they don't go and think about what they're going to fuel with during a session. I promise you, if you fuel that session, you're going to get absolutely, you're going to get better performance and recovery. The human body also has natural fuel for many hours of exercise, which can be taken advantage of in certain conditions. But if you go and train faster than you do a high intensity session, you are going to deplete glycogen. And if you keep having to train the body over and over, because it does take time to replenish it, you might land up with a domino effect and break yourself down. And eventually you're going to hit a level of fatigue. And very often, multi-sporters do hit those levels of fatigue. You see training peak numbers are speaking to them in these wonderful languages that show the load is perfect and um, because most of that is based on either sort of power or threshold data or pace data or heart rate data. Um, but the problem is, is that there's a human body and from a human point of view, they might not have had a decent night's sleep. They might not have eaten properly. They might be in a severe calorie deficit. So the load that you're seeing from a numbers perspective is not what's actually happening inside the body, and that can often lead to breaking down. So very often the numbers are not telling the the full truth, and they're not showing the full picture. Okay, are there any questions on this before I move into the next uh, section? Any 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 questions at all? Okay. So if we're talking about practical fueling strategies, um, I think it's important to, to understand, first of all, when it comes to carbohydrate fueling, what are the recommendations? We spoke about low carb to sort of high carb fueling. Sports nutrition guidelines have always been like between 30 and 60 grams of carbohydrates per an hour. Uh, but you do notice and you do see people moving to 90 grams to 100 grams i've got athletes that are up to 120 130 grams of carbohydrates per an hour personally i'm on 112 grams to 113 grams of carbohydrates per an hour and when i take a look at an individual i always say if you can get a gram of carbohydrates to a kilogram of body weight per an hour that's pretty good um, but in my case like i weigh 66 kilos and I'm taking 113 grams of carbs per hour, I'm way above one. I'm above one and a half grams of carbohydrates per kilogram of body weight. I'm heading closer to two grams of carbs per kilogram of body weight. What is the benefit of that? If you can tolerate that, the only drawback I tell people is that when I'm feeling at that level, I've got so much energy, I just feel like I've got to push harder for longer. And that's not a bad space to be in, especially if you've got gastrointestinal comfort. If you can feel like that and your energy system is stable and you're feeling really strong it's an amazing sort of space to be in especially during exercise okay so this chart actually was taken from Asker Jukendrup who's actually a 
for those, I mean, a lot of people know he is. He's a sports scientist. He was actually one stage, he was the uh, CTO, actually. He was the chief technology officer of uh, Powerbar many, many, many years ago. Um, he is a lecturer. He's a professor. Uh, he lives in Holland. And um, he's dived into sports nutrition a lot over the last couple of years. And there's a lot you could learn from a guy like that. And this chart actually comes from our sports science, uh, which is one of his uh, sites that he does, writes blogs on research studies quite regularly. And he basically looks at duration and carbohydrate intake. And he basically says, so between zero and 60 minutes, you could get away with small uh, amounts of malferin. There was something called a malferin test where they took two groups of elite triathletes, put them next to each other. The one group, they fed carbohydrates. Uh, the other group, they did that did a fasted session. They noticed that the group that was on carbohydrates performed the time trial way faster than the group that wasn't fueling. Again, carbohydrates equate to performance. But then what they did was they did another test where they took two groups of these elite triathletes, did the same testing protocol. They made the one group swallow the carbohydrates. They made the other group put the carbohydrates into their mouth, swirl it around, and spit it out. So not swallow it. And what happened? Both groups perform because when the carbohydrate hits the tongue, triggers is a neurological response, and that trigger actually allowed for an improvement in performance. So it was a very interesting study they did. But that just shows you how carbohydrates, even just the taste and that signal, can actually trigger performance improvement. So if you look from 60 up to two hours, you'll see that he's gone at 30 grams of carbohydrates per hour, two hours upward, 60 grams of carbs per hour is recommendation, and then three hours upwards, 90 grams of carbs per hour. Okay, <clears throat> so this is a very interesting thing. 30 grams of carbohydrates per hour is actually very easy. You can take any source of carbohydrates. It probably wouldn't matter. There's no real limitation. But once you get to 60 grams of carbs per hour, now you've got to start to be careful because... There's two channels in the human body where these glucose sources or fructose sources can go through, and they are limited to how much damage they can handle, process, break down, utilize source of energy per an hour. The fructose channel is limited to 30 grams per an hour. The glucose channel is limited to 60 grams per an hour. So if you are trying to get in 60 grams of carbohydrates per an hour or more, and you go with a high fructose source, you are going to cause gastrointestinal distress. You will not be able to ingest that amount because you're going to overload that channel. And so very often the type of carbohydrate that you utilize as your energy source does need to be taken into account. A lot of people like to fuel on natural food. So, I mean, take a date, for example. Uh, a date is high in fiber, high in fructose. It does have a portion of it that's glucose but it's predominantly high in fructose. And I had an athlete once who told me that he likes to eat dates while he's cycling, and he was taking in 100 grams per hour, but his stomach was not coping at all. It was absolutely uh, coming into knots and excessive gas. And obviously because the fructose amount that he was taking per hour was probably closer to 55 grams per hour. But your body's only limited to 30 grams per hour that it's able to process. So... We had to switch his fueling strategy because he was actually trying to get around 75 grams per hour. And the kind of carbohydrates that he had to ingest would have to be conducive to supporting it. The glucose channel is limited to 60 grams per hour. So you can go with pure glucose at 60 grams if you want. Um, but if you want to go higher than that, then you limit it. So what we talk about from an ingestion point of view, from a carbohydrate ingestion point of view, is something called multiple transportable carbohydrates. In other words, taking a glucose source carbohydrate, taking a fructose source carbohydrate, and combining those together in order to be able to maximize both channels. And that's where you get like uh, two to one, the glucose to fructose ratio will allow you to have 60 grams of glucose, 30 grams of fructose. And if you've got 60 and 30, and you're maximizing those channels, you can get to 90 grams per an hour. Okay, <clears throat> how do you get higher than 90 grams per hour? Now you've got to start using multiple transportable carbohydrates that are stage releasing, that break down in different parts of the digestive system. You've got your upper bowel, you've got your intestinal tract, 
you've got upper and lower. And so basically some of these carbohydrates will break down in, in different regions. And by utilizing various sources of carbohydrates, you're able to allow for a much higher and a more efficient absorption rate without causing or triggering gastrointestinal distress. Okay, and so that's what we do with um, sort of blends that are required for people that want to go up to 100, 110, 120 grams of carbohydrates per hour. And it's not so simple as just going from zero to here. You can't just say, oh, I've been on 30 grams per hour, now I'm going to go and suddenly consume 90 grams per hour. Remember what I said? The human body needs to speak that language and it needs to adapt over time. It's not something that's just going to happen overnight. You've got to train and train your gut. Just like you're training your muscles, you've got to train your gut to adapt to that kind of fuel or that feed. And you've got to see if it works for you. Okay, so how do you how do you decide how to build a feeding strategy? And I created something many years ago called the tipping point method. And this is how you optimize your carbohydrate fueling. You, depending on what amount of carbohydrate you're taking per an hour, <clears throat> you start low and you build up higher over a period of time, but you do it incrementally. And you do it gradually in order to allow for the body to train the gut over a period of time so that you're not throwing it under too much stress. So let's just, for example, say you have been consuming something which is in the region of maybe 30 grams of carbohydrates per an hour. Okay, and now you want to start to see what that level of comfort to energy is. Then you could start maybe increase it by 10 grams, go with 40 grams of carbs per hour. It needs to be a measured amount. The best way to fuel is to drip feed. So taking in 20 grams of carbs every 30 minutes is better than taking 40 grams all at once. Split it over 30 minutes. I always say the 20 to 40 minutes, but 30 minutes is pretty optimal. And go on a fairly intense session. It doesn't have to be uh, too intense, but like heading into zone three, more maybe tempo effort, and see how your digestive system functions and see what your energy system feels like. Do you feel strong? Yes, you're feeling great. Is your stomach uh, feeling comfortable? Is your digestive system comfortable? Is there any distress or are you feeling good? You're feeling good, great. 40 grams is bad. Now try and move to a higher amount. Next you go, 50 grams maybe now or 45 grams per now. So gradually try and increase it, try similar sessions generally longer sessions because that's where over time, you know, with longer sessions and the body heating up a little bit more and losing a little bit more fluid, this is where you're really putting the digestive system under stress and you can really sort of test this. Try it out, see how it works. You hit 50 grams, great, you bank it. Now you know you can take 50 grams per hour. Then the next week, you're going to try and go to 60 grams per hour. Now you're taking 60 grams and all of a sudden, you feel discomfort. You're feeling bloated. You're feeling a bit of cramps. Uh, the energy is there, but you're not feeling comfortable. <clears throat> now you have to take a step back. That's your tipping point. That's your tipping point where you triggered gastrointestinal distress. And now you've got to go back to where you were last comfortable, which was at 50 grams. So stick to 50 grams for another week or two. Keep doing it. Do it maybe two, two times a week, three times a week uh, in quality sessions or longer sessions for yourself. And then try and step up, not to 60, but step up to 55. 55 works, stick with it for a week or two, and then go back to 60. If you go back to 60 and it works, great. Stick with 60 for a bit and then try and build to 65 or 70. But if you get to that tipping point where it's not working, let's say you've tried it, you've tried to adapt your gut, you've really tested it, it's not working. It doesn't mean that your stomach cannot handle that amount of carbohydrates, you might need to look at the kind of blend of carbohydrates that you're taking because maybe what you are consuming is not conducive to the amount of carbohydrates that your body is trying to process on an hourly rate. So I spoke about those multiple transportable carbohydrates. Maybe the blend is not correct for you. Maybe you've got slight fructose intolerance. Maybe there's a little bit of glucose intolerance. Maybe the way that product is structured is not structured in a way to allow for a 90 gram per an hour or higher. And this could ultimately be causing the gastrointestinal distress. And that means you need to switch to something that 
might work and you might need to try and move to another kind of carbohydrate blend uh, in order to see if that works well for you. Okay. Any questions on that? Okay. Right. So <clears throat> if I look at fueling from a, whenever you approach fueling, you've got to look at it from an hourly fueling perspective. You've got to decide how much I'm going to consume for an hour, uh, per an hour, and then you've got to break it down. You've got to break it down into those drip feeds, into those 30 minute feeds. So this is just a multi-hour system of drip fueling. So in the middle here, you'll see I've got something that says fuel dispenser. A fuel dispenser to me is the kind of sort of way that you're going to be fueling. It could be from a bottle. It could be from a gel. It could be from a bar. It could be from chews. Um, this is just an example of a fuel dispenser. It's a squeeze pouch, a soft pouch. As an example, I could have a concentrator fuel in there. There are different ways of fueling. So that, that fuel dispenser really, it's just a matter of what's convenient for you. Are you running? Are you cycling? How are you going to carry it? And is it convenient? And then you've got to take that and you've got to break that energy down into an hour. And then you've got to transplit it into 30 minutes. So if you're looking at 30 grams of carbs per an hour, that equates to 120 calories. And you can actually see that means that you know, I'd have to take 120 calories, first hour, second hour, third hour, fourth hour. But if I had to go into 60 grams of carbs per hour, it would be double that amount. So what I took for two hours with a 30 gram, I've got to take in one hour uh, for 60 grams. And if I go to 90 grams, what I took in an hour, um, and hour one and hour two, now I'm going to have to split that feed into 40 minute feed. So what I was taking over, over, um, an hour, I'm going to have to reduce that to 40 minute feeds for that same amount, 240 calories, basically, which is 30 grams every 40 minutes to get to my 90 grams per an hour. Okay, so that's 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 basically how you would break it down. Um, why do you want to drip feed? Because the energy system has peaks and troughs. And if you don't feed for a while, you're going to, if you feed quite a bit, like let's say you feed at 60 minutes or 45 minutes, you feed. And that energy system then starts to drop and you're waiting 45, 45 minutes, it's going to actually make it might just crash down and you can have this feel good, feel bad scenario. The more frequently you feed, the less peaks and troughs you'll have and the more stable your energy system will be. The other thing that you've got to also think about is that smaller amounts on the digestive system at any one time are more manageable for the digestive system to cope with. If you throw too much into the digestive system at once, your body's got to utilize and break down that, that amount of energy. And it's possible that maybe it's too much of a stress on your digestive system. But overloading it with too much at once if you're not used to it. So drip feeding does make it a little bit easier. Um, I just noticed that there is um, a question here. I'm just going to quickly go through it. When training your gut, can you increase your limits of glucose and fructose processing? Or is this the absolute maximum for those two? So it's a very interesting question. It, it, it generally is the maximum, but some people, you know, we genetically, we're all different individuals. Everybody's got a different kind of a stomach. Some people are lactose intolerant. Some people can just drink milk, tons of it, and it doesn't impact them whatsoever. I think you need to try and experiment and, and see what works for you. I wouldn't try and max out the glucose and the fructose channels. I would look at a dextrin as another... Um, as another fuel source, which actually breaks down quite rapidly into a, a large amount of what we call uh, monosaccharides when it hits the the bloodstream. So, um, I, I would I would I would probably look at fructose and glucose and adding in a different kind of a a source for a uh, for another carbohydrate. It just makes it just easy on the digestive system because there there generally is like a, a maximum amount. Um, it's not cast in stone. I'm sure that there are unique individuals out there that can handle what other people can't but it is a matter of testing and seeing what works for you um, but generally that is like sort of roughly the cuddle um can you step your fueling through the race to go high in carbon consumption towards the end i think that's very difficult and i'll tell you why because the longer the race 
and the hotter it gets and the more fluid that you've lost, the more sensitive your digestive system becomes. And so what actually happens is, is that the digestive system doesn't work as efficiently as it did earlier on. I always say maximize your fueling early on to set yourself up for later in the race. And we'll run through sort of triathlon fueling a little bit uh, more in depth. Um, I'll get to it in, in the next uh, two slides. Okay. So I just wanted to uh, speak a little bit more about this. Um, there's different kinds of carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are broken down into monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides. Uh, monosaccharide is like a it's a single molecule. You're talking fructose is a monosaccharide, glucose is a monosaccharide. A disaccharide is two molecules bound together. Sucrose or table sugar is a disaccharide. You've got a fructose molecule and a glucose molecule, and they're bound in a one-to-one. -one. Okay. So can it be a source of energy? Yes. But are you limited? Yes. Because it's a one-to-one, -one, you're limited. So you can't just go and rely on sucrose or or, or one of these to be able to just fuel a large amount of carbohydrates per hour because the, the, the stomach's not going to be able to handle breaking that down in large amounts. Then you get something called a polysaccharide. A polysaccharide is like, if you think about a, you know, take a little piece of, of string or wire, I don't know if you can see this over here, and put little molecules on either side of it, 18, 20, 24 molecules, whatever it is, uh, of uh, monosaccharides. That, that enters the human body. Uh, when it gets broken down, it floods the bloodstream with monosaccharides. Okay, and that's a polysaccharide. So polysaccharide is like a string of a lot of monosaccharides. A polysaccharide is the only carbohydrate kind that is not classified as a sugar. It's classified as a complex carbohydrate. And those are usually what we call dextrins, which are derived from their starch sources like potato or maize starch, etc. Um, and they're not classified as sugars, but do they impact blood sugar? Absolutely, they impact blood sugar. You take a sugar-free yogurt, I guarantee you that that thing's loaded with sugar. Not on the label, because they're using a starch, but when that thing goes into your body, boom, it can elevate blood sugar significantly, because they can use cornstarch or some kind of a dextrin in order to remove the fact that they've got to put a sugar claim on the label, and so I get a lot of people telling me, oh, I use products that say no or low sugar. Well, sometimes it's nice to know that it's sugar and to see it on the label because then you know what the quantity is. But if it says sugar-free, you need to really check the ingredients very, very carefully because very often these food companies will pull the wool over your eyes and it will impact blood sugar without you actually realizing it's way more than the amount of sugar that was in a product anyway. The sugar is not always the evil. Uh, it's sugar-free, that can be the evil. So just keep that in mind. Um, and very often you'll look at a label on any kind of a sports nutrition supplement, just as an example, it will say total carbohydrates, of which are sugars. So if the carbohydrate content is 60, and it says of which are sugars, maybe 30 grams, then those 30 grams could be made up of some kind of a glucose or fructose um, uh, ingredient. And the other 30 grams, would be made up of a dextrin, which is a polysaccharide. And that's exactly why, uh, so only half of it would actually be classified as a sugar, the other half wouldn't. And that's just a little lesson on label reading. So just understand that. Okay. Just on a, um, from a product perspective, and I'm not going to deal with like a lot of other sports brands here, but like if I look at the 32 GI range, for example, I think it's very important that like, this is something that we do that a lot of brands don't do. And the reason we do it is because I think it's very important for the, the user of a product to understand exactly based on the kind of nutrition or the kind of amount of fueling that they want to take in, which products would suit it and which products wouldn't. So if I look at the 30 gram column, every product can support 30 grams. Obviously, every product can support 60 grams of carbs per hour. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. And then if I have a look at, um, you know, uh, the column of 90 grams, you'll see I put crosses there. Why? Because our standard snap gels do not allow for 90 grams of intake per hour. They might allow for 75, but not for 90. Because they are maximizing and overloading those systems. 
So when I look at a glucose and fructose channel, I would say that those products are not suitable. Sports juice, not suitable. Endure drink, not suitable. Triple tabs, not suitable. The only products that are suitable are the race drinks, race pro gel, race pro energy ball. That can give you 90 grams. I actually, the only reason that I actually land up getting 112 grams of carbs per hour is actually the race pro gel works very well for me. I can take one gel every 40 minutes. That's 300 calories every 40 minutes, and it actually works quite amazingly. I've got a very sensitive stomach, but we use something in there called a cluster dextrin. Cluster dextrin is a very expensive dextrin. It's very expensive. Um, we use quite a large amount in there. It's a cyclic dextrin, um, so it's circular. Remember I said you get a string of molecules on a dextrin on either side. This is circular. It's got a very, very... Um, high rate of absorption and it gets pulled out of the gut very quickly and actually gets utilized as an energy source quite rapidly. And that's what makes it very easy on the digestive system. So that's blended with other carbohydrates and that allows for a much higher uptake. So again, the, the kind of fueling strategy that you want to implement, you need to make sure that the product that you are utilizing will be suitable for the amount of carbs that you want to take in from an energy perspective on an hourly basis. Something else that's quite important to stress is people make soup mixes all the time. If I'm using a product that's absorbing at a very specific rate, it is designed for specific functionality, for a specific absorption rate on an hourly basis, um, for digestive comfort over that period of time. If I mix that product with another product, I will not get the same result. I can take a slow-releasing carbohydrate and a quick-releasing carbohydrate and throw them into a pot and I don't know what my digestive system is going to do because those two products were not designed to be together. They were designed for different uses and different kinds of levels of effort or training sessions or racing sessions over a period of time. And so that very often upsets the boat when people start to mix things. And I often see that. Uh, a guy comes to me at an expo, he says to me, I tried these products and I had such bad stomach cramps. Uh, I say to the person, well, what did you do? This was a comrade's one year. I said, well, what did you do? He says, well, um, I ate uh, eggs on toast before the start, two hours before, uh, a half an hour before the start of the race. I drank an energy drink, five minutes before I had a gel, and then I had a peanut butter sandwich, then I had jelly babies, then I had a nougat bar, and then I had another gel, and then I had this and that. I mean, that's crazy. That's like making a vegetable soup and throwing meat, chicken, eggs, and every other thing inside of there and thinking that your stomach's going to be okay. When it comes to sports nutrition, simple is best. If you've got a product, that is going to meet your requirements, stick to it. It's going to work. Don't don't actually land up in a, I'm not confident enough it's going to support my energy system. If you've tried and tested during training, it's going to work during racing. And the only way to know it's going to work during racing is if you practice and try and test it during training and make sure that what you're doing is working from a digestive comfort point of view and supporting you from an energy perspective. Okay. Right, I just want to, okay, uh, I don't know, I mean, I'm assuming that most people on here are triathletes, so I just want to talk a little bit about, let's um, look at how we would fuel from a triathlon perspective. Okay, so the first thing I always look at is pre is the pre-race meal, okay, and pre-race meal should be consumed at least two to two and a half hours before the start of an event. Why should you consume a pre-race meal? It sets up the energy system amazingly. Failure to have a pre-race meal or even a pre-training meal, if it's a long session, um, will not set up your energy system and allow it to actually function at an optimal level to support the level of performance. Um, and, and that's quite important. Um, just sorry, there's a question over here. Okay, so somebody spoke about salt tabs. I'm going to get to that during the hydration session. We'll talk about salt. Um, so what what is a pre-race meal made up of? Generally, you want to try and get your blood sugar slightly up and stable. Okay, but you're going to utilize it. You're absolutely going to utilize it when you're doing exercise. I've never seen somebody doing exercise with elevated blood sugar what you take in is going to be pulled out. The muscles will take it up and use it. So a pre-race meal should be high in carbohydrates, a little bit of protein, uh, low fiber, low fat. 
that's pretty much a perfect free race mix. Okay. The reason low fiber and low fat, low fiber, fiber does is not used as an energy source. It can cause gastrointestinal discomfort. Um, you know, you get soluble and insoluble fibers. It's like eating plastic in a way. Uh, if it's insoluble and um, and and it can, with free race nerves, etc., it can just trigger uh, gastrointestinal distress. Uh, fat is like I mentioned before, it takes a very long time to break down fat and utilize it as a fuel source. It's not an efficient fuel source. So is is fat going to become a energy source for you immediately? No, it's not. It's going to take a long time to be able to be broken down and utilized. Carbs are broken down quite quickly. Protein is broken down at a rate of about 9 to 12 grams on an hourly basis, and it can be utilized as a fuel source, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But that really is a, a suggestion. Uh, what what is what kind of meal there? I mean, we've got for many years. I used something which was a pre cooked, uh, which was a basically an overcooked uh, white rice pudding. Uh, add a bit of honey, banana, cinnamon, mix it up. Add a little bit of protein powder if you want, or peanut butter. Put it in there. So it's got a little bit of protein, very little bit of fat, and you can eat it off a spoon. And based on that, we launched a pre raised meal, which is pre cooked white rice flour with a bit of maize, pre-cooked maize flour and then a little bit of protein and you can add it with hot or cold water or milk and you can you can eat it. I sometimes add a teaspoon of peanut butter in or a teaspoon of honey and sometimes banana or berries. You could have white bread. It's low in fiber. Um, you can have a couple of slices of white bread, throw some honey and banana and peanut butter on there. It's also fun. Uh, some people like oats. You can have oats. Um, I, I would say go with a very low fiber oats if you can so a more highly processed oats as opposed to like a rolled oats because that's high in fiber and that might cause a little bit of impact so you go with like a little bit more of a processed oats you can also add some honey and banana inside of there and you can eat it so those are the kind of meals that i would look at from a, a pre-training meal some people like to eat meat i i don't understand that it's definitely not going to be uh setting up your energy system at all uh, some people like to eat uh, eggs on toast. It's also not going to set up your energy system the way you want to. Uh, yes, it might be pretty, you, you know it might it might be coming across as a fuel much much later, but initially it's not going to set you up, and you need fuel to set you up quite quickly because in the very beginning your digestive system has to be comfortable. You're going into a swim. Uh, you're not. You, there's got no way of fueling during a swim, and for some people it's short. For some people it's very long. Um, but your next fueling is a step is actually only going to be after you exit the water. Okay. Pre-race hydration. Should you be hydrating before a race? Absolutely. Um, I'm a big fan of mineral loading. We call that hyperhydration, H-Y-P-E-R. Hyperhydration is increasing your mineral levels, specifically sodium, to maximize fluid absorption. And I saw earlier about adding salt to a solution. Um, Salt is used for fluid absorption. It's not used for energy absorption. So you've got to distinguish between energy and hydration. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. And um, I actually believe in mineral loading about two to three days before an event. So I actually advocate taking a hypertonic solution, two to three bottles a day, uh, electrolyte tablets. I mean, I use a 32 GI hydrate. You can get plenty out there or just add a quarter of a teaspoon of salt into your water if you really want to. Um, obviously, you you know you do get products that have got a bit of a broader mineral spectrum because it's not just sodium. You've got sodium, potassium, magnesium, et cetera. Um, and just topping it up. On race day, I don't like to overload the bladder, so I'll probably have you know, a glass, uh, a little bit less fluid, but I'll, I'll top up again just before, a um, couple of hours before. Okay. Uh, Pre-race from a performance perspective, you could take in caffeine. Um, it, it does help with freeing up free fatty acids, which can be utilized as a source of energy during the event. And uh, it also helps with mental focus. It helps with lowering the RPE, rate of perceived effort during exercise. But you need to try caffeine during training to understand how your stomach will feel during racing, etc. because there are some people that are intolerant to caffeine and it can cause gastrointestinal distress. Not everybody. Some people love caffeine. I'm a big fan of it. I take a lot during exercise, um, but for some people, um, they're just unable to tolerate it. Okay, so that's pre-race. Waiting for the start. Obviously, between the pre-race meal and the start, there could be a period of time that could be, I don't know, it could be two hours, maybe two and a half or three hours. 
obviously the longer it is, the more ability you've got also to snack and sip on an energy drink or take some stuff leading up to the start. I wouldn't overload myself, especially not overloading the bladder, etc. cetera. Um, but um, I like to sort of sip and, and take a couple of things before. But within half an hour before the start, if I'm going to take something from an energy perspective, it would be to be easily digestible, uh, easy to consume, and something that would set you up before the start. So you could take a gel maybe 10 minutes before the start, take a caffeine shot maybe 10, 15 minutes before the start. Um, some people like to just snack on a banana. I wouldn't have that 10, 15 minutes before. I'd probably have it more like half an hour to 45 minutes before. I'd like maybe eat or you know, nibble on a banana, etc. Uh, just remember, whatever you take prior to starting the swim, it needs to be broken down and utilized as a source of energy. You don't want anything sitting in your stomach. When you're buoyant on the water, your digestive system, again, is not functioning at its optimal, and you can end up with a little bit of gas and discomfort especially if you're buoyant. So you want to make sure whatever you're taking in is broken down and utilized as a source of energy and it's not sitting heavy in the stomach. Okay. So I'm gun goes off. Um, there's just a few tips here. I'll, I've got a little guide that we'll send you after this presentation so you can read this, but there's a few swimming tips over there that I've got from some of the other coaches as well um, that uh, have got main areas of focus. So I just plugged it in. After the swim, you exit. However long that is, if it's a half Ironman, for some people it's 20 minutes, for some people it's 40 minutes, but it's still a period of time where you haven't been able to take in any energy. What do you do? I always advise to leave some nutrition in the bag in T1, okay? I like to leave it in the form of a liquid or a solid. It depends on what I feel like and it depends on on uh, on what I want to do when I exit. And generally, I will actually take in energy um, sip on something or eat something quickly before I actually head off to the bike and the reason I like to do it is because once you're going to get onto that bike the last thing you want to do now is start to focus on okay I need to fuel I need to eat and you don't want to land up with a 30 or 40 minute gap between the swim and then starting to fuel on the bike it's just too long it might even be in some cases I've seen 60 minutes so rather take on some nutrition it's a couple of seconds. It's it's a ready. It's a short amount of time. Take on nutrition in T1. Um, I usually take a, a bottle of hydrate with me into T1, and I take a, a bottle of like a race pro energy drink, for example, or some form of an energy drink. And I just like to take that in and just sort of get some energy into the system before I exit on the bike. And the reason I suggest that is because when you get on the bike, the last thing you want to do is really just focus on having to eat straight away what you want to focus on is getting comfortable and getting into sort of an equilibrium in other words you want to feel balanced it's a bit of a weird feeling obviously coming out from the swim and getting on the bike it takes about 10 to 20 minutes to start to get into a rhythm and only once i'm in a rhythm then i will start to feed on the bar. And that will usually happen around the 20 to 30 minutes in. But I've already taken energy in T1, so I'm not stressed about feeding on the bar. The bark's your kitchen. You have to feed on that bar. Your energy, your, your digestive system is very stable when you're on the bark leg. And because it's stable on the bark leg, the body can handle a lot more. It's not high impact like running. And, and so you've got that ability to actually consume a nice amount of energy while you're on the bark. And our time on the bark Every 10 minutes, I will sip from a hydration perspective, and every 10 minutes, I'll sip from an energy perspective. And I like to alternate like this, so that every 20 to 30 minutes, I'm actually consuming something in the form of energy and, and setting myself up. And that amount of energy that I'm taking in will be a measured amount that I know that every single hour will be either my 60 or my 70 or my 80 or my 90 grams of carbs per an hour, and I never deviate from that at all. Um, We'll talk about liquid and solid feeds, etc. I'm going to get into that. Make sure that you feed like clockwork on the bar. Clock feed on the bar. If you have to set an alarm or a buzz on your watches or whatever, do it. Don't forget to feed on the bar because that bar is going to set you up for the rest of that event. If you fail to fuel properly on the bar, you're setting yourself up for a very difficult run. Okay. Some people lose bottles on the bar or 
they lose energy on the bike. Make sure that you, whatever you're doing is going to manage to stick with you through the bike leg. But there can be mishaps. There can be technicals. You might have taken too little nutrition because of a technical. Rather take a little bit more than a little bit less. Um, because remember, if you do get a punch or you do have some kind of a technical and you've got to stop, you don't know how long you're going to stop for, but the clock keeps ticking and your energy system keeps working. Even when you stop, your energy system is still burning off. So you just don't want to be uh, landing up in too much of an energy deficit. Okay, coming into T2, again, I leave a hydration and an energy product in T2, in my T2 bag. Why? Before I go onto the run, I like to sort of top up and make sure that I'm actually okay for the run there. Sometimes I've fueled so well on the bike, I don't need that in T2, but I always leave it there as a just in case. Just in case I didn't have enough on the bike. Just in case I lost a bottle. Just in case I needed to take on something, T2 gives me an optimal period in order to be able to take on some more energy or if I need to take on a little bit of hydration before I head out into the run. Because when I head out to the run, the last thing I want to do again is have to focus on fueling straight away. I want to try and focus on at least running a couple of kilometers, getting into a rhythm, and then eventually maybe you're going to hit some water tables en route, and maybe that's when you'll start hydrating. Um, I don't like to rely on energy on any triathlon course ever. I would prefer relying on my own energy, and that would just be a backup in case it's needed. And just as a simple example, I raced... Uh, um, I raced half uh, with his Ironman Middle Eastern Champs in Israel last year in November. I did the half there. Uh, 32 GI were actually the official nutrition sponsors on course. And every time on the run, I ran past the water tables. There was a guy who knew me who kept screaming at me to take a product. Take this, take that. And I rejected every single product he offered me at the water table. And afterwards, he came up to me and says, I don't understand. Don't you use your own product? And I said to him, the products that you had on course were not the products that I trained with. So I took my own products on course, but they were not the same products that they had on course. And so the thing is, is that you've got to understand what you train with, take that to race day. It's quite easy to do. Um, there's a lot of ways to make sure that you, it's very easy to carry. If you look at the pro athletes on course, you'll notice they take their nutrition with them all the time. They don't worry about water tables. You don't know if they're taking from a cup, if they've diluted it to the right ratio. You don't know if there's too little energy, if there's too much energy. Um, you know, how they mix the powders, drinks. What kind of drinks, you know? Have you taken whatever's on the tables before? Have you utilized it? Have you taken it to that extent? It's just much better as well to make sure that you are in control of the entire situation and you're not really reliant on just everything that's on a course. Okay. Uh, on the run leg, again, um, you might find this a little bit harder to take things in. At this stage of the race, generally, hydration is very, very important. So make sure that you are hydrating properly. Um, and when it comes to hydration, I'll talk about it a little bit more. Water on its own is not good enough. The absorption rate of water on its own is very limited. So let's say, for example, you can absorb 160 milliliters of fluid per every 20 minutes from a water perspective. If you add a, if it becomes a hypertonic solution, and when I say hypotonic, I'm talking about uh, HYPO, hypotonic solution. Um, in other words, elevated minerals, etc. Then you will end up increasing that absorption rate. So you could go from 160 to 200 to 220 milliliters of fluid per an hour. I, ne I'm, I don't believe in taking water on its own. I always say a mineral solution is way better than water, uh, especially because you, when you are sweating, you're not, just ex you're not just losing fluid, you're actually excreting minerals as well. And loss of sodium and loss of fluid over time actually upsets the balance. You want to try and maintain that balance. And in order to maintain that fluid balance, you need the minerals as well as the fluid in order to be able to do that. Okay. So that's just a bit of an idea of how to sort of uh, structure the fueling from a triathlon perspective. Okay. So when it comes to energy versus hydration, I said you need to keep it separate. What, what, why do you need to keep it separate? Something that's very important. If you're relying on energy in a bottle, let's say you've put 
I don't know, 40 grams of energy into a bottle and you've got two of these bottles, which is 80 grams of energy and you're planning on filling it up at a water table or whatever it is. What if the temperatures drop on race day? What if they're cold? What if you consume less fluid? What if you can't drink that amount of fluid because you're not excreting that much fluid in the form of sweat? So because you're not losing so much fluid, you don't have to ingest that much fluid. Then if you're relying on energy in that bottle, because maybe it's an isotonic solution, your energy intake is going to be a lot lower than what you actually need, and you're going to land up in an energy deficit. So rather keep the hydration and the energy separate. And when I say that, it's quite easy. I take maybe two hydration bottles with me on a on a course, and I can top those up en route. Um, I put a I put a effervescent tablets in those bottles. I put a hydration solution in there. If I need to top up, I can always top up with a bottle en route and drop another tablet in. That's fine. But I like to use a either a form of energy that I know is measurable. Some people will, I've seen them strap gels to their top tube or they've got a little pouch or whatever and everything is packed there in order for you to be able to know like every single 20 or 30 minutes I'm going to be eating this or I'm going to be taking this gel, whatever it is. And then I've got my hydration bottle separately. And that's the best way to fuel on the bike for any event. What I do is I actually use a soft pouch. Um, I use a 250 or 300 milliliter soft pouch. In one soft pouch, I can dispense three to four gels. Um, that's 1,200 calories, basically. If I take four gels into a soft pouch, it's 1,400 calories. I've got a pocket in my tri suit that can fit in the back or I can stick it in a pouch, whatever it is. It's got a bite valve. All I've got to do, it's got measures, it's got markings on it. All I've got to do is basically sip and make sure that I'm taking a certain amount out of that pouch every single hour so that my energy is nailed. And second to that, my hydration is in the bottle. And that is the most efficient way to fuel. With some of the pro athletes that I've worked with over the last 15 years, um, a lot of them use a concentrated drink. We call that a hypertonic solution. And that's HYP or hypertonic solution is an energy solution. It's a measured amount. Some of them dispense gels in a bottle, some in a soft pouch. You'll see a lot of the pro triathletes these days are running with soft pouches in the front of their suits. And to be quite honest, it makes it so much easier when you've got a measured amount of energy and you're clock feeding all the time and you're taking your fluid off the course and you're hydrating off the course when you need to. But on the bike, you can have everything. On the run course, it's very easy to run with a soft pouch. Um, even the elite athletes do, and they just take water off the course. They like to control everything from beginning to end. Um, and, and that's really the best way to fuel. So you need to separate hydration and energy because temperatures are going to change. If it's hot, you need more fluid. And if you're relying on energy in a fluid bottle and you're taking too much, very possibly it's going to cause gastrointestinal distress. And like I said, if it's cold and you're going to take too little, you're going to have a lack of energy. Okay, from a hydration perspective, remember it's calculated based on temperature conditions and individual needs. Obviously, the hotter it is, the more humid it is, the more fluid is going to be lost. And when it comes to fluid loss, like I said, there needs to be a sodium balance as well. And I'm a big fan of taking in, like I said, a mineral solution or taking in sodium or salt tablets to try and maximize fluid absorption. And, and it's very important to, to do that. Okay, you cannot replenish 100% of fluid loss. It is not possible. Okay, if, you, if you're losing a, a, a liter of fluid in an hour, you cannot drink a liter of fluid in an hour to, to, to balance it. You, you can try and aim for an 80% of fluid loss kind of scenario, but you can't go to 100%. You'll cause hyponatremia, which is an overload of fluid, which causes uh, dilution um, of sodium. And if you've got too much fluid and you dilute your sodium, it can lead to a very, very dangerous situation. Uh, there have been people that have passed away from overhydrating. Um, and you can't you can't endanger yourself from dehydrating. The worst thing that will happen is you feel fatigued, you feel flat, um, but you can always rehydrate. So determining factors obviously is check the temperature on the day that you're training at, look at the duration that you're going to be performing at. Um, and then obviously the weight of an individual also determine how much fluid is lost. So obviously the, the bigger you are, the more surface area you've got on the skin. Uh, the bigger bones you are, the taller you are. I mean, literally, those heavier people and bigger people are going to lose a lot more fluid. 
uh, then a people will lose a lot less fluid. And so that does play a, a very vital role in determining how much fluid you should be taking in. How do you know how much fluid you should be taking? Now, a lot of people say to me, I'm going to do a sweat test. I'm not a fan of sweat testing because it's in a very controlled environment. And when it's in a controlled environment, it means that that sweat test has determined what your fluid loss is in a controlled environment. A race course is not a controlled environment. When I raced last year overseas, I thought the weather was going to be great. It landed up being the worst rainstorm we ever, and winds we had ever experienced. I was freezing on the court. I could not take in the amount of fluid that I wanted to. Um, uh, my fluid was a lot lower. My energy was fine. But it was pouring and pouring with rain the entire race. Did we take that into account? Sure. I mean, in training, I understood in cold conditions and hot conditions. So the way I like to assess fluid intake is I weigh myself before training session. I weigh myself after training session. And I look at what my weight loss is. If you weigh 65 kilos, an example, and you finish a session and you're weighing 63 kilos, you've lost two kilograms of weight. Two kilograms is two liters. How long did you train for? Maybe you went for three hours. So you lost two liters in three hours. Look at 80% of those two liters, okay, which will land up being 1.6 liters. And if it was over, let's say, three-hour period, take your 1.6, divide it by your three hours, and that's probably how much you should have been taking in on an hourly basis to try and meet those fluid loss requirements from a hydration perspective. If I did consume a liter of fluid during that three hour, my weight loss is actually not two kilos, it's actually three kilos because I consumed a liter, but I lost two kilograms. So actually the total loss would have actually been three kilograms. And so I would work backwards and, and calculate what my fluid intake should be. Okay. Salt intake, it varies from individual to individual. The latest science has shown that the amount of salt you consume in your daily diet will have a direct impact to the amount of salt you should be taking from a hydration perspective during an exercise session. If somebody doesn't take any salt, in other words, they're just using foods which are naturally salted and they're not eating a high sodium diet, chances are they're going to lose less sodium when they're exercising and their sweat's probably going to be more hypertonic and there's more fluid in their sodium. And so they might not need to be taking in as much salt during exercise. It might be a nominal amount that could take in to help with absorption. And that could be between 250 to 500 milligrams of sodium on an hourly basis. Somebody that does use salt in their diet and, and has a fair amount, maybe their sodium intake might be between 400 to 700, 800 milligrams per hour. And those high sodium meters could even be on the higher spectrum. Um, I mean, I know people that do take 1,000 or 1,500 milligrams of sodium per hour. But don't overdo it on sodium. It's something that you do need to try and test during exercise, training, and make sure that that is supporting what you need. And you'll see if it works for you or not. Um, I take on average about 500 milligrams of sodium per hour in a hypertonic solution. And then my energy solution has probably got another 100 per an hour, 120 per an hour. So I, I'm sort of like, I'm generally between the 600 to 800 milligrams of, of sodium per an hour, and I find that that works very well for me. Uh, if there's a day where it's extremely hot and I'm really sweating and it's very, very hot and humid, um, then obviously I can look at increasing my sodium intake. Um, but I do take a little bit more salt in my diet. Uh, admittedly, I love salt. Um, but because we exercise and because we sweat out a lot, um, it's not as health hazardous to us as it would be to a sedentary person. So yes, we do lose fluid on a day-to-day -day basis while we're exercising. Um, so I think naturally our salt intake might be higher than what dietary guidelines would say, but we are athletes and we are uh, requiring that from a rehydration perspective. Okay. All right, this is a question I get asked a lot, taking in protein. A lot of people tell me that when they take in protein, they feel better. Um, sometimes if they eat built on it's not the actual protein that's making them feel better sometimes it can be the fact that there's salt on it and that's making them feel better it could be from a hydration perspective because it's salty and that sodium is coming in and that's making them feel a little bit better protein is not an efficient fuel source it's not like it gets broken down and utilized immediately as a source of fuel and i mentioned earlier that protein uh, can be broken down about 9 to 12 grams per an hour 
roughly nine to 12 grams per hour. And so can you utilize it as a fuel source that you're taking in those amounts? Yes, absolutely. It's one gram of protein is four calories, a gram of carbohydrates is four calories. So if you're taking in, let's say nine grams of protein um, and 50 grams of carbs in an hour, you'd actually have 59 grams of like, you could call it energy and multiply that by four. That will give you your calorie intake. Is it a fuel source in long distance races or I would say any events that are over a certain period of time, like maybe two and a half to three, four hours or longer, I think protein does play a very beneficial role. It stabilizes your blood sugar, so it can mitigate spikes and provide a bit more of a stable release. Um, it also does help uh, prevent what we call sort of muscle protein catabolization, which is when... Uh, over many hours, what happens is you're utilizing your fat substrates and you're utilizing your carbohydrate sort of substrates. Those are your fuel substrates. And uh, and then what actually happens is, is that your body says, listen, I need a bit of a balance. The brain controls everything. I need some equilibrium. So I'm going to actually break down uh, protein and I'm going to use that as a fuel substrate. So uh, just to try and find that balance. And that's a process called gluconeogenesis. And you would want to try and mitigate your body from utilizing your own muscle protein with gluconeogenesis and actually try and uh, just ingest the protein to mitigate that. And, and you definitely, in ultras, you feel a lot better by ingesting a portion of protein along with carbohydrates. It works extremely well. Um, okay, so Mark's asked the question, would it be ideal for T2? I'll get to that now, Mark. I'm going to answer these questions now. Um, okay, I just want to get to um, how do you approach sort of race day? Let's talk a week before. Okay, just a couple of tips here. Keep it clean. In other words, try and keep your daily diet as clean as possible. Try and keep away from processed foods. Try and keep it more whole foods. And try and eat foods that are helping you from an energy perspective, from a a perspective of recovery from making sure that you get to race day feeling energetic, uh, feeling strong, feeling recovered and ready for the day. No alcohol. I'm a big believer in the science of alcohol does prevent recovery. It definitely prevents recovery. It dehydrates you. It's got no benefit whatsoever. It's a toxin. People don't like to hear that, but it is. And it's not going to play a benefit in setting you up for race day. Um, so keep alcohol out, save it for after the race. Don't overeat. A lot of people say to me that they're going to carb a load and then they end up gaining like a kilogram or two kilograms of weight. And like, the question is, is it glycogen weight or is it actual weight? And if it's glycogen weight, then you've got to ask yourself, is it going to play a massive benefit? If I increase my glycogen, by a certain amount, but I'm going to do an ultra. Chances are no, it's not going to make a, a massive benefit. If you're running a marathon in like two and a half hours, yeah, I mean, if you can top up those glycogen stores, great. But if you're going to do an ultra and it's going to be four, five, or six hours, an extra 50 or 100 grams of glycogen, talking about like a couple, you're talking about like 100 or 200 or 300 or 400 calories. It's not going to make a massive difference in the big scheme of things, especially when you're burning off something like maybe between six and 900 calories per hour. It's not really going to make a difference. Okay. So don't overeat. If you land up with non-glycogen weight gain, and it's just weight gain, um, can that impact you? Yes, it can. Why? Because let's say you've been training at a certain weight and now you're going to race at a certain weight. Uh Think about this. I'm running. I'm not going to give you a cadence of 90 per uh, a minute, which is 100, a cadence of 180, uh, 90 per each step. I think it's just a matter of we look at like a cadence of, let's say I do a cadence of like 80. 80 steps per minute on each leg. So it's a cadence of 160 in total between it. Okay. I gained two kilos. What's 80 times two? It's 160. That's 160 kilograms, more force per minute, times that by 60. That's tons 
absolute tons of force going through my body over an hour. Will that trigger fatigue? Absolutely. Could I cramp? Possibly. Overstrained muscle. Muscle not used, used to that kind of, of sort of race weight. You've been training it a lot of it. So overeating is something that I do see sometimes because you've been training and you've been building up volume of training over a period of time. And then what happens is, is that you suddenly now tapering that volume of training, you're reducing the load, you're sharpening yourself up towards the race. And so your calorie burn rate drops down. And when your calorie burn rate drops down, you've got to eat in line with what your calorie burn rate is. You want to try and eat in an energy balance. So if you're burning off so many calories, you can eat so many calories. But if you're burning off less, you've got to come down. You've got to come down. You've got to try and maintain an energy balance. You don't want to end up gaining unnecessary weight while you're going through a tighter period. Okay. Sorry about that. Just wanted to mute. All right. Hydrate. Very important. What is hydration? You should be hydrating by taking around 30 to 40 milliliters of fluid per kilogram of body weight per day. And if you're training, even more. So if you're weighing 60 kilos, times that by 40 milliliters of fluid per day, you're talking about 2.4 liters for a 60 kilogram person. But if you go and exercise, you might need to take in more. So maybe you'll be closer to two and a half to three liters of fluid per day. Uh, is coffee a form of hydration? It's been shown that coffee doesn't really cause dehydration, but coffee does impact your sleep, and that's the next step. I would cut off caffeine earlier on, rather focus on getting good night's sleep, especially the week before the race, because the better you sleep, the better you recover, the better you empower your performance. Okay, let's look at three days to the day before the event. Again, keep it clean. This is where I suggest reducing fiber intake, and the reason I suggest reducing fiber intake is to reduce the risk of gastrointestinal distress. Not going to play a major role, but some people that eat too much fiber can cause uh, gastrointestinal distress, and that's something that you don't want to do. Avoid any foods that you're intolerant to. So if you're lactose intolerant, then stay away from lactose. If you celiac, stay away from gluten. Just simple example. Don't eat foods that will impact you negatively. I had an athlete once um, that did comrade and landed up in the first 15, 20 kilometers in the bushes. And I was like, why? Like, what happened? My stomach was terrible. Well, what did you have as your pre-training meal? No, I had a cereal with uh, milk. I'm like, well, why did you have milk? Aren't you lactose intolerant? Yes, I am. But what else must I have it with? I'm like, well, have it with orange juice if you have to water, but don't have it with milk. You know it's negatively going to impact you, so why have it? The year after that, this athlete did exactly the same thing and landed up back in the bushes. Lesson wasn't learned. So stay away from any foods that are going to impact you negatively. Again, no alcohol. Okay. The 24 hours before, this is where, or the days before, this is where you can slightly up carbohydrate intake. But if you're going to up carbohydrate intake, don't go and overeat from a calorie perspective. If you're going to up the carbs, drop the fat down a little bit. Okay. So for every one gram, for every two grams of carbs you eat, you drop one gram of fat. Because basically a gram of fat is around nine calories. A gram of carbohydrate is four calories. So two grams of carbs will give you eight calories. A gram of fat will give you nine. And you can play this sort of balancing game. But you can start the up carbohydrate intake in order to be able to set up your energy system. And that's absolutely fine. But again, play that calorie balance. Hydrate, mineral loading. So I mentioned that before. Hyperhydration, mineral load. I would take in uh, some bottles of hydrate a couple of days before and uh, up to the day before. I don't like to take them too close to sleep because you don't want to overload your bladder. So my cutoff might be at like four or five o'clock in the afternoon um, and I'll get a good night's sleep. Then. Okay, sleep is a very, very important focus. Okay, let's look at the day before. So if the race is on a Sunday, we're talking this is Friday night. Sleep in later on a Friday night, go to bed, get a good night's sleep. You don't have to wake up bright and early on the on the Saturday morning. Sleep later, maximize your sleep. And the reason I say that to people is because the night before an event, pre-race nerves impact 90% of athletes, maybe even more, maybe 99% of athletes. People battle to sleep the night before a race. 
they are pre-raised nerves and some people don't manage it as well as others. So maximize your sleep two days before so that the night before, if your sleep's impacted a little bit, at least then you've still managed to get some good sleep in the 48 hours leading into the race. Definitely no alcohol the day before. Uh, I mean, people do it. I don't understand it. If you want beer, have alcohol free. No overeating. Again, don't overeat. Hydrate, mineral load. Um, lunchtime is where I'd have a slightly uh, larger meal. And the reason that I say that is because a lot of people go and they love these big meals at dinner time to set themselves up for the next day. But that's crazy. Dinner time should be a small to medium sized meal because the focus that night, like I mentioned, is sleep. And if you overeat at dinner, you are going to battle to get a good night's sleep. So keep that meal very manageable and very small the night before a race. You don't have to worry because the pre-race meal, which is the next day, is going to set you up. So that pre-race meal the next morning, that's where you're going to really set up your energy system. That dinner the night before is not really going to set up your energy system. Okay. So you don't have to go and overeat the night before. Um, it's going to impact your sleep. Your body's going to have to break down what you're eating. You're going to lie in bed with the stomach and it's just going to be uncomfortable and it's going to impact your sleep. So rather just eat something that's medium, medium-sized meal. And then remember, the next morning is where you're really going to set up your, your energy system. Race day, pre-race meal, pre-race hydration. Uh, both of them should be planned, tried, and tested uh, during training so that you know what to do. If you are traveling overseas, et cetera, to a hotel, you're staying somewhere, I always take my pre-race meal with me or I know what it's going to be. If I'm in a hotel room, it needs to be manageable and I need to be able to prepare it. So... I will take my my bottle of peanut butter, my bottle of honey, my pre-race meal sachet. If I want to take milk or almond milk, whatever it is, because I am lactose intolerant, or whatever it is, and I've got a kettle there, I'll make sure that I take it. Um, so I like to always be prepared. I don't like to rely on hotel food unless I know, you know, what's going to be there, and that would be suitable from a pre-race meal perspective. Pre-race hydration, like I mentioned earlier, don't overdo it. Um, you know, you don't want to overwork the data. Some people can handle a lot of fluid. Some people can't. Whatever is, is good for you, you know, look at taking. But again, you can mineral load a little bit. Caffeine. Should you be taking caffeine? If you want the caffeine benefit, generally one to three milligrams per a kilogram of body weight. Uh, and that's quite a bit. So that means, like, I, you, I would rather go on the up end, like the three, three milligrams at least. And for me, that would mean 200 milligrams of caffeine which equates actually to maybe like four espresso, strong espresso. And that's a lot. So what do I do from a caffeine ingestion perspective? I take in a measured amount of caffeine. I will have a coffee because I love coffee pre-race or pre-training. I love it. I've got a French press and I drink it a little bit, whatever it is, and I enjoy it. Or some people have got their espressos or a machine or whatever it is. Like I like a good coffee. Um, it just gives me... It's, good mood food for some people and it makes me feel good um, but if I'm going to rely on caffeine I will take a measured amount and in that case I will take in uh, around 200 milligrams or I'll take three G shots I just down them it's about 180 milligrams plus the coffee will give me over my 200 milligrams of, uh, of caffeine um, the one thing about caffeine though during an event is caffeine reaches peak concentration levels within 60 minutes so if you're taking it during an event during the race you can't take it and then stop taking. If you take it, you got to keep taking. You've got to take it in under the hour because once it reaches peak concentration levels, it's going to start the downer. You don't want to feel that down. So in order not to feel that downer, you've got to keep ingesting caffeine. So you've got to determine, am I going to take it early on or am I going to take it towards the end? If you're going to take it, make sure that when you start taking it, you've got enough to take all the way to the finish line. Um can you take it through a whole race? Yes. Uh, I did challenge Roth in 2016. I took a caffeine shot, 60 milligrams every half an hour. I took 120 milligrams an hour. That was 10 caffeine shots on the bike. And then I took one every single half an hour on the run, which was like another maybe four or five caffeine shots on the run. So in total, I actually had about 120 milligrams per an hour over, we'll call it about a nine-hour period. Um, that's close to a thousand milligrams of caffeine in a row. Um, so yes, you can do it if you train in it and uh, and uh, and you find it works for you and it's a benefit. But you do need to try and test it during training. Okay, just finally, rules of engagement: never ever arrive at a race 
without a proper efficient stand in place. Think about what I've told you tonight. Try and test it in training. Work on your hydration, work on your energy. Find the products that are convenient to carry in the various disciplines, what you're going to use, when you're going to use it, and test it out because without that, it's an unknown. And I can promise you that if you bank this, if you manage to get this right, however long it takes, it might take you three months, it might take you four months, but you can see now that it's not like you can decide four or five weeks before a, a, a race, like now I'm going to work on my nutrition strategy. You might start working on it now, but you're going to have to tweak it and move it and shift it and shape it as you move along over time. There was a stage where I couldn't take more than 60 grams of carbs per an hour. And only over the last two years have I managed to get up to this 112. But it's taken a lot of training and testing and trying different things to get there. And and now I've found the, the, the sort of amount and the kind of product that works for me the best. So always test your nutrition during training and and make sure that you monitor your energy level and you also monitor your digestive comfort and i diarize things like you should write it down otherwise you forget um, it's always good to make a journal of what you eat and when you eat and how you consume because each time you read it it's going to imprint in your head and you're going to say okay i did this maybe that was wrong maybe this was right it's always good to actually put it out in black and white and take notice of what you've taken when you've taken it and that will allow you to sort of strategize and plan it a lot better um, remember I spoke about that tipping point method to start low and build high. I'm going to, you guys are going to get a brochure. <clears throat> it's like a little fuel guide. All this will be in there. And we also, we've recorded this and I'll send you the link and we've got the presentation that I can send you as well. So if there are any kinds of questions over and above that, you're always welcome to email or touch base with us, but I'm hoping that we'll give you enough info to, to really start this process. Um, and then, so once you've tried and tested this from a hydration energy perspective, go and test it out in a proper training session. If it's a triathlon, I would use a brick session. I mean, I would literally go and do, I probably, if it's a half Ironman, I would definitely do like a 90K time trial and maybe run 10Ks off the bike, but a really hard uh, effort on the TT and then go go run 10Ks off the bike or, or whatever it is, or 12Ks and, and actually see how I feel on that run. Like make sure, have I set myself up from the bike to go into the run and in the run am I still feeling strong did I manage to nail that last one or two kilometers on the run that allowed me to finish feeling strong sure your muscles will be tight but you can feel when your energy system is stable and strong um, and if it if you felt like it just wasn't enough then do it again and again and try and make sure that you try and test it you'll be very surprised if you feel correctly how you're going to actually have that ability to improve your performance numbers your times will drop your power, your pace numbers will improve. It makes a really big difference. Okay. So that's it in short. Um, if there are any questions, I'm going to go through some questions now, but if there are any questions, feel free to ask. If you haven't got any questions to ask now and you think of something later, you can always email coach at 32gl.com. It does come to me. Um, and I do, it's a first in, first out. So I do get emails on a daily basis and I try and respond to as many of them as possible. I've also been skidding up this AI on our website. So the AI can also answer some questions as well. Um, on the main page, if you go there on the 32gl.com site, uh, there's a little artificial intelligence bot. You can ask it some questions. Um, I've skilled it up with about two and a half to three million words. I'm still teaching it all the time. It's a big project. This I've got to keep skidding it up every week. Because sometimes people ask questions and then I review the question and I realize the answer that it gave was not good. So I've got to go and restructure that answer and then upload it to the system. And so it's, it's quite a it's quite a big task. But but if if I feel the AI is an, as an if you feel the AI is an answer to you, send an email to tell me you asked the AI, it wasn't a good enough response, and I will be able to respond. Okay, so just to run through some questions, I think if I'm not mistaken, Mark asked, would it be ideal for T2? I'm assuming to have a protein shake in T2 or some protein in T2. And absolutely, that's fine. Um, I'm a big fan of that. I have a carb protein shake sitting in T2 for me. Um, I, I, like I use our Race Pro, which is a which is a drink. I put only instead of putting a full serving, I put like maybe one or two scoops into a small bottle, and I down it before I go onto the run, and that works well. And I actually do the same in T1. I find that it just works very well for me to have a protein and a carb combination. 
So I don't know if that answered the question, but I'm assuming that's what you did ask. Um, if reducing your caffeine intake the week before will have any impact. Okay, so that, it's a very important question. If somebody is caffeine intolerant, um, taking caffeine is going to impact them in a much bigger way than if they are caffeine intolerant. I mean, if you're consuming four cups or five cups of coffee a day, which is, you know, maybe and it's maybe they're spaced very close together. And like the one thing about coffee, for example, is you never know how much caffeine is actually in a cup of coffee. I understand that the strength of the coffee is not about the amount of caffeine. It's the it's actually the blend of the bean. So 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 you don't know how much caffeine is in the coffee. Some people say to me, I drink coffee and I fall asleep. It's it's possible that there wasn't a lot of coffee, a lot of caffeine in that blend, and it just it was just a strong blend. But at the same time, I can promise you because I analyze sleeping patterns that if you have coffee before you sleep, I can actually see that, and it's the same with alcohol. You can actually see heart rate variability changes, light and uh, uh, light and deep sleep cycles are impacted, and you definitely don't get a proper night's sleep. It does impact your sleep, whether you like it or not. And how far from sleep does it impact you? Well, I said that the the caffeine reaches its peak concentration levels in 60 minutes, but a quarter of that caffeine can still be sitting in your body eight to 10 hours after you've drunk it. So what does that mean? It means that if you drink coffee, like let's say, after sort of 10 or 11 or 12 o'clock during the day, and you go to bed at eight or nine o'clock at night, that caffeine can still impact your sleep. And there's some really top sleep scientists that have done the research. And it's actually quite amazing what they've discovered. So uh, my coffee cutoff is in the morning. I finish my coffee before nine o'clock and I don't take it after that. Is it going to play a bigger impact if you reduce caffeine intake prior to the event? Yes, it will. It will give you a little bit more euphoria. It will probably make you feel that lowered rate of perceived effort. But I don't, like to feel the stress of having to cut caffeine so what i do is i just reduce instead of having maybe two cups of coffee i'll reduce it to one cup of coffee in the morning of uh the week before a race uh, but during the event i maximize that caffeine intake which is way higher than what i would be taking normally and that does make a difference okay um how often in a week should you test your nutrition plan for gut comfort etc okay so i think this is where this is what I call carbohydrate periodization. This is what I call uh, testing. Testing your nutrition and training is like really, if you think about it, it's actually going to be done in longer sessions on the weekend is where you're really going to test it. Um, because those are the sessions that will probably be more of the endurance key session. But if I've got a quality session during the week, it could be, like I mentioned, the VO2 max, FTP, hill repeat, track session, uh, whatever it is. It could be hundreds or 50 sprints in the pool, whatever it is. I will fuel those quality sessions. Why? Because it will give me the ability to perform way better. I'll get better training adaptation. I'll recover a lot quicker. But it will also, during very high intensity sessions, will also show me is my gut managing to cope with what I'm actually ingesting. When I do recovery sessions or recovery rides or, you know, just as an example, I might sit at, I don't know, between 60 and 70% of FTP on a train. I'll go ride with a Zwick pacer or whatever it is. I'll do that faster. I'm sitting in an aerobic zone. My heart rate is sitting in an aerobic zone. And if my heart rate is sitting in an aerobic zone, then I want to make sure that I'm maximizing my ability to burn fat and be more fat efficient. Um, because that does benefit the human body as well. So I'm not saying ingest carbohydrates all the time. What I'm saying is is that high quality sessions fuel the effort. Low quality, more aer well, aerobic sessions are not low quality, by the way. Aerobic sessions are very important, and probably 80% or more of our training, because that's where we actually create the best mitochondrial density. Uh, this capillary production, the circulatory system. I mean, that's where we actually or improving our, our fitness and our ability to perform. A lot of people actually overtrain a lot. And so if you think about it, most of the time I'm not fueling if I'm mainly aerobic, but the 20% where I'm actually putting in efforts, those are the times that I am testing my fueling. Um, I'll show you something interesting if we've got a gap quickly, um, just a, a, a little infographic there, but let me just go through some of the questions. Um, 
so none of, none of the 32 GI gels have got caffeine. Uh, we've got a specific caffeine shot, which is a only caffeine gel, which is not an energy gel. It's got very low energy. It's caffeine. It's called a G-shot. Uh, we keep caffeine out of the gels. And the reason being is that I don't like to mix caffeine with energy. I think there should be measured amounts and they should be separate. Um, okay, I, I, if you guys have got a sec, I won't be long, but I, I think it would actually be quite nice to just quickly show you the slides. I'm going to share my screen on my phone. I just want to find this quickly. Um, and this will, you know, a lot of people say to me, um, how do I know I'm training in the correct zone from a fueling perspective? And I think it's very important. If I go back to to this slide over here, and I think it's very important to just show you this, this slide over here. Zone one to zone five, which are your sort of sort of five major heart rate zones, are it's quite important. Like if if you're looking at your watch, it might tell you which zone you're in, but your watch has then got to be configured to make sure that you know exactly what your maximum heart rate is and what those percentage of zones are. And that's not always a hundred percent. But generally in zone one, if you're having you should be able to have a full conversation with somebody. You should be able to speak long sentence structures. And take a breath here or there, but it's a conversational zone. And if you're in a conversational zone when you're exercising, you know that you shouldn't be fueling with carbs because you're burning fat. The same as zone two. It's a, a lengthy sentence structure. It might be eight or nine words that you could say, and then you take a breath. So you could say, hey, the weather's good today, or how are you doing? And then you need to breathe. And that's also pretty much a, a short conversational zone, but you're getting enough oxygen in to be able to support the level of effort as well as talk to somebody. And that's what will tell you in zone two. And then again, you know, chances are you don't need to really be fueling much for that session. It could be very low to no cost. But once you go to zone three, you're probably limited to like maybe four or five words. And then you know that you're more glycolytic because oxygen is limited. You could say, it's hot today. Breathe. Um, you know, how's your mother? Breathe. <laughs> Simple thing. When you get to zone four, there's only one word you can say. You can't say more than one word. And usually... If you speak to somebody in zone four, it's not going to be a nice word. <laughs> they get very upset. And that word's not going to be nice. Zone five, there's no speaking. I've never seen an athlete, a track athlete, 800, 400, 100, they're not going to go and have a conversation during that effort. They don't breathe. It's crazy. So it's very, very difficult. They're just focused on getting as much oxygen as possible. There's just no talking. Okay, so that's how you could basically you know. I just want to quickly show you something. I'm going to quickly share this. Uh, share it because I've got this uh, on my phone here. And I'll show you something very interesting. It's one of the biggest mistakes that athletes actually make. So sometimes you get athletes that are training in very specific zones and they think that they actually are in an aerobic zone. But what we find is that they're actually not in an aerobic zone. And I'm just going to turn this sideways. So well, I wanted to show you this. So, so this is an athlete um, that I picked up in the US who's, uh, so this was lactate threshold testing to determine where his aerobic threshold, his lactate threshold was. And you can actually see that his aerobic threshold, his aerobic zone is so small. At 120 beats per minute, he's already crossing over into his glycolytic zone. That is a very under, it's a very, he's not a very well-trained athlete. His, uh, his aerobic zone is very, very limited. And mostly, if you ever look at general athletes that ride with a stronger cycling group than their ability or run with a stronger running group than their ability, and they've been pushed out of their zones, they are not running in an aerobic zone. So they're not, they don't have the ability of training their aerobic engine and making it efficient. This is the biggest problem. And that zone three requires fueling. But it's actually limiting the athlete's ability to progress because you need a here or there. And most coaches will work on what we call uh, it's sort of like a more linear kind of approach to training. It's polarized training where you predominantly working in the aerobic zone and making it more efficient and then staying out of that zone three and working more in that anaerobic zone where you're actually pushing above lactate threshold and you're actually also pushing VO2 max or you, you, you're working in your muscular system leg speed, leg turnover, power, etc. And those are the two zones that most people work in. Working in this middle place is not really giving you much of an advantage. 
So what happened to this athlete? The coach said to him, listen, realizing that he was very limited from an aerobic perspective, for the next six months, your heart rate is not allowed to go over 120, 130 beats per minute. And the athlete looked at him and said, you must be crazy. It means I have to walk. He says, if you need to walk, then you walk. After six months, this is what happened. Aerobic zone went all the way up to 150 beats per minute. Look how small that zone three is. That is how you want to condition yourself as an athlete. And that's amazing because that means that up to that threshold, that aerobic threshold, his fueling is pretty much being fueled by his natural fat stores alone. He's very efficient at utilizing that. And by the way, when you break down fat into ATP, it produces an abundance of ATP molecules. Where carbohydrates broken down into ATP is a much smaller amount. So if you get athletes that are performing, I mean, some of these guys that are running two hour, 10 marathons, et cetera, I mean, their, their, their zones, their aerobic zones are incredibly efficient. They are amazing at, at running in these zones. Um, up to much higher heart rate and utilizing their own natural abilities to do so. So it's very important to understand what your zones actually consist of. Um, I would suggest if you have got the ability to go for a lactate threshold test, I love to run them on people, show them the truth because it really is to me a gold standard or to uh, go for VO2 max testing and to test what these zones are. But the, you know, you are able to test and see and, and that will give you a better idea of how to feel yourself. So I just thought that that might be you know, something that would be nice to to, sh to share with you guys. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to share my screen again. Okay, so I just want to see if there are any more questions. I think that was it. Um, okay, so I think that that really uh, covers most of the most. Okay, there was one new message. Okay. It's a pleasure, guys. Look, I hope that uh, the session was uh, valuable. Uh, I really do. Um, if there, if there, I, I hope it maybe stimulated or lit up a few light bulbs of maybe some ideas or some thoughts. Feel free to share them with me. If you've got a question or you want to share a feeding strategy with me or you want to ask me something, drop me an email. I will respond. Might not be immediate, but within a couple of days or sometimes within a couple of hours, it depends on whether I've got the ability to access. Uh, I love to help people. I love to empower people with the knowledge of making the best decisions for themselves. Um, I just believe that the more you're able to uh, get your fueling right, and it's not just about from a performance perspective. You know, If you're looking at sports nutrition before, during, and after exercise, it's more from a recovery perspective, from a health perspective, from supporting the body's requirements. We are not normal people. We're not sedentary. We're putting our bodies through physical endurance every single day. And the body does need nutrients and support in order to be able to stabilize the energy system, help the muscles recover, replenish those glycogen source, stabilize the blood sugar. We don't fall into the category of normal human beings. We fall into a category of a very tiny percentage of the human population of planet Earth, which is probably, we're probably crazy because of what we do. But it does create what we call longevity and hopefully also health span. Um, and so fueling and sports nutrition, you know, in and around the training definitely does make a difference in supporting it. Okay. So that's it. Uh, take care. Hope you guys have a good rest of your week. Um, I'm going to stop the recording here. We'll send out the links uh, 